This is a quick wrap-up video to, to finish up our discussion of graphical models. Of course, in a course like this, we don't have enough time to go into too much into detail on these types of models, but I want to make sure I leave you with the ideas of you know, why these types of models are useful and what topics of research are still ongoing about these things. So one of the reasons that the main reasons that people are, are still interested in graphical models and why they were invented in the first place is that they represent a modular language for describing probability distributions. And it's general enough that you can you know, draw a picture like this and it, and it basically describes a whole family of different models. So in here, this is the a Markov chain example where I haven't written on the screen. I've, I, all I've drawn on the screen is that the, 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 is the dependency structure of the variables. And w it leaves open what possible parameterizations you might use to describe the dependencies between variables. And the algorithms that we use to do inference and learning, depending on what we, uh, how we parameterize these things, change a little bit, but they roughly, they roughly retain the same structure. Moreover, we can modify the structure pretty easily as modelers, right, without having to think too hard about the underlying algorithms. So we can add observations like we did for the hidden Markov model, where then we, we have these other variables that depend on the chain variables. Um, or we could do things like create a grid of variables that have local dependencies with their their uh, adjacent neighbors in a grid, and of course this is a one of the more popular types of graphical models out there because they they can be used to analyze images, so they they've become very popular in computer vision. So you might look at how graphical models can be used to analyze pixel grids to do image restoration, segmentation, uh, depth estimation if you have two two images from a left camera and a right camera. Um, and then you can do th more high-level things as well uh, by modeling high-level variables like the locations of objects or location of shapes. And this is a slide from Pedro Felsen-Schwab's um, UAI 2012 tutorial on graphical models for computer vision, where he went over a bunch of these applications. And uh, you can follow these links to, to watch that tutorial if you're interested. But another type of, at least in these settings, we're usually thinking about graphical models that are that are designed by the modeler. So the modeler decides, you know, I'm going to have variables representing the pixels, and the pixels are in a grid. Or we might say, oh, we're going to represent time steps, and so we're going to have a variable for each time step and have a relationship or a dependency between the same variable at different time steps. But in another type of setting, we are given some data. And the data gives us a really strong hint about what the dependencies are in the variables. So for example, if this network here were a social network, so all the nodes represent individuals in a social network and the edges represent communication between the individuals, then we might be able to use this to define dependencies between variables describing the individuals in the social network. So we could have a variable that describes uh, an, an individual's political preferences and, and we would say that these variables are dependent along their communication connections. So if we have one individual here who uh, says, drill baby drill, which was one of the catchphrases for the Republican Party in the 2008 election, um, and then we have a, an individual over here who says, yes, we can, which was Barack Obama's uh, campaign slogan, I believe in 2004, I don't think he used it again in 2008, um, then we might be able to infer their political preferences, but moreover, we might be able to use those to, to infer the political preferences of the other individuals in the network based on the fact that we believe there, there to be these local relationships, these local dependencies between those variables, right? The, the, the dependencies that depend, that are affected only by individuals who speak to each other in, in some sort of physical network. So, this is a situation where the dependencies among the variables are defined by relationships in the data. And this is a very powerful view and leads to a whole area of research called relational learning where you use 
the fact that a lot of the data, a lot of the information we, we, we collect from the world and store in databases in our computers are relational in nature. Right? They describe relationships between entities in the real world. So if we use these relationships to define the dependencies between our variables, we can automatically build the structure of a Markov network or a Bayes net based on data. So with that, I'll leave you with two more slides. I'll talk about some uh, the, the promises of graphical models. You can think of this as the advantages of graphical models, but some of these uh, advantages have not been necessarily fully realized. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of the challenges that remain for the graphical models, uh, the development and research of graphical models. So the promises come from the fact that we're looking, we're, we're using this, this language of, of graphs to describe, to describe a general purpose declarative representation of distributions. Right? It's declarative in the sense that the modeler just says, well, let's put a node here to represent a variable and an edge here, and that, that declares some notion about, or some knowledge about the independent structure of a, graph, of a joint probability distribution. And the benefits of having a general purpose declarative representation is that we can then improve models and algorithms independently. Right? As a modeler, you can go in and just change your graphical model, you change your graph structure if you believe that some other graph structure better represents your, your real world system that you're measuring with data. And if you're an algorithms person, you can, come, you can change algorithms that just operate on some graph, some abstract graph. And you can analyze these algorithms using graph theory, right? You don't have to think specifically about any particular data domain or any data problem. So you get general domain agn agnostic analyses. For example, one of the simple things we, we looked at when we studied belief propagation in the last video was that belief propagation is known to be exact inference in tree-structured graphical models and only known to be an approximate inference algorithm when you have cycles in your graphical model. But then that doesn't say anything about what the variables mean or where they're collected from or, or what, you know, they could represent a time series or they could not represent a time series. None of that really matters. All that matters is the structure of the graph. So this modularity of the analysis on the algorithm side and on the modeling side pro provides a nice separation that allows for progress on both sides without necessarily needing expertise or lockstep progress together in both areas at the same time. So that some of the challenges that come up with all these promises are that one, the graphical model language is actually too rich. It's too general. You know, a big sign of this is the fact that inference and learning are NP-hard in general. And, and this has been proven that inference, right, if you can solve inference in a probabilistic graphical model in polynomial time, by some definition of what the size of the model is, uh, then P equals NP, right? So, so that's, that's not good news because we were, most people are, banking on the assumption that P is not equal to MP. And what that means is we have to resort to approximation algorithms when we want to do inference in general graph structures. And then there's lots of open questions there about the quality of the approximation algorithms. And we have small pockets of known families among all possible graphical models and associated algorithms that do admit guaranteed approximations or bounds but in general, it's usually just a heuristic. You usually just say, well, I'm going to build a graphical model, and I know that inference in this graphical model is intractable, but in practice, it gives us pretty good results. But this is, this is where the open problem is, because we are still searching for the situations where we can guarantee good results, and these guarantees can take different take, can take different forms, right? It can be worst case guarantees or it can be expected case guarantees. But in either case, we we have a very limited set of conditions under which we can make formal guarantees. But with all that said, it's graphical models are still very very useful in practice, even if some of the guarantees remain open questions. In many cases, the ability to declaratively describe the dependencies and independencies in your data 
it outweighs whatever uncertainties we have about the worst case behavior.